whether Bicu can do his introduction from, his, from where he is now, and then Paul will come up to the lecture. I'm not going to see you, so I'm perfectly happy. Uh, you can speak loudly, can't you? Because I can, I can, I can bring the mic to you. Can, do we just see how it works out? Okay. You can start when you, when you want to and try and. I think we might start. And I hope you are all happily settled for the next hour or so. So I'm, first of all, I begin by welcoming you uh, to this Gandhi Foundation meeting. It's made possible by a lot of efforts, by a lot of people including the Nehru Center, and I want to begin by thanking the Nehru Center for loaning us its facilities and making it possible for us to have someone of uh, Paul Razor's eminence. And there is, I think there is also, uh, there are other reasons also why I should be thanking both the Nehru Center and uh, the Gandhi Foundation, but I shall skip those things so that we don't spend time simply thanking each other. <laughs> but that can easily take up an hour. <laughs> what I would rather do is to say something about the speaker and why this particular event is of considerable significance to us. Now, Paul is an eminent person, an actor who played Gandhi, father of the assassins, but equally importantly, he has built up a career involving a number of characters. He started in a number of theater, he, start, he, he has starred in a number of uh, theater, TV, radio, and movie productions, including theater in London's Weekend Quiz, also at Chichester and Twelve Night. Other productions include Does Dear Elizabeth at the Gate, Notting Hill, The White Devil at Shakespeare's Globe. God, you choose titles which are fascinating. <laughs> Drawing the Line at Hampstead. Where I played Jinnah. <laughs> the Jinnah of Elga. East is East in Last Dance at Dum Dum at the Royal Court. So all those wonderful things and the Duchess of Mafti for Brighton Festival. So for all those things, he has been known and we admire him, which is one reason why somebody who played the role of Gandhi was of particular importance to us, Paul, without taking up too much time, and simply to whet the appetite of the audience, I hand over the meeting to you and look forward to listening to you with great expectation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've just got some water here. Um, uh, you'll have to excuse me. I've got a slight cold, which often happens at the end of a theatre run. You put it all off until the, the last night, and then suddenly your body complains. Um, dear friends, thanks for doing me the honour of asking me to speak to you today. Whenever I'm asked to do something like this, um, something I've not done before, I always feel a stab of fear, and my shadow self tells me I'm not qualified to do it. I'm used to speaking on stages through other people's voices, not through my own. Um, and whether it's to be the trustee of a peace charity, or to play Gandhi, or speak to a group of eminent people such as yourselves, um, 
But I also have a practice of saying yes whenever the universe presents me with a, a challenge. So here I am. Um, as you know, I've just finished playing Gandhi at the National Theatre. Um, we finished on Saturday night in um, Anupama Chandrasekhar's wonderful play, The Father and the Assassin. We did it last year, and the National were not expecting it to be the success it was, and we were only supposed to do it once. But we sold out, and um, people couldn't get tickets, and so they brought us back. Which I think, you know, it was a play that was on in the biggest theatre, the Olivier, 1,200 seater. They were not expecting us to sell out. It was a fully British, Asian, and Asian cast. There was no one famous in it. It's not a famous writer. But I think there's something about the resonance of Gandhi that, that touches people that they didn't expect. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the play. So the play begins with um, Naturam Gorsi, who, who was Gandhi's assassin. And he speaks to the audience like this, and he suggests to them that after they've heard his version of events, they might end up building temples in his honor. Now, this is happening in India, in some places. So, Anupama is from Chennai. She's born and bred in India. And she wanted to write this play as a reflection about India, but also about the world. It's a very set of universal topics. And I think that's why it really res people res respond to it. Um, so in one way, this play is an examination of what might turn someone into a premeditated murderer. It presents Godse's worldview and that of his mentor, Savarkar. It also presents Gandhi's worldview all the way through the play. And we follow Gandhi's life and Godse's life until they meet that fateful day. And then there is an imagined conversation at the end of the play where they confront each other. Um, but I also like to think Anupama is a very delicate writer. And it's a play that is anti-polarization, which I think is one of the great uh, evils of our current society. It's an anti-cancel culture play. It asks you to put aside your prejudices and to genuinely stand in this young man's shoes. Walk with him for two hours, which is what Gandhi would have liked us to do, I think. And then it suggests we make up our own minds. So I've been asked to talk to you a little about what brought me to the place of playing Gandhi, how I prepared, how I used the practice of spinning to deepen my performance, and what I learnt from this process. So a little bit about me. My parents were born and bred in Chennai, and they moved, both moved to England in the early 60s. I was born in 1968 in South London. And I grew up in a very humble, non-artsy setting. There were no books in my house. There were no artists in my family. But there was a lot of delicious Indian food and a family, and an extended family, who spoke of this magical place that I'd never visited. Um, I still had a lot of in family in India, but we didn't have the funds in the 70s to go and visit them. In fact, my dad never saw a lot of his brothers and sisters again. The India of the 50s and 60s that they described, my parents, my auntie and uncles, it seemed colourful and vibrant and alive in a way that England, dull England in the 70s, didn't seem to me as a child. I think actually what was going on, which is what happens with a lot of immigrants, first-generation immigrants, was that they were equating their youth with the place they'd grown up. And they were bemoaning being middle-aged in, in another country. But as a child, that passed me by. Um, I, though, I was a timid child and I was not sporty, and I, because of this maybe, I suffered from the malaise that many second generation immigrants suffer from, and that is that I never felt quite at home or welcomed in the only country that I'd ever lived in. It's a very strange place for second generation immigrants. Um, and maybe that was the thing that made me timid, I don't know. But it certainly made me, and I felt that I was very easily spotted in my difference because of the color of my skin. I also felt uns uh, um, an unsettling fear of lots of things. I was scared of the dark, death, bullies, um, the disapproval of authority figures, things that I discovered that Gandhi was 
was a very, very frightened and timid child, which I hadn't known. Well, one of the seminal experiences of my childhood was, was of our family going to the Odeon in Croydon and seeing Richard Attenborough's film, Gandhi. And I was 14 when it came out. And it was unusual for lots of reasons. It was unusual because my mum and dad came with me. and My dad never went to the cinema. Um, secondly, we were at the cinema on a weekday evening, and it was full of adults. And it was full of Indian, South, South Asian people, lots of saris and, and beautiful turbans, and you know people who you, I didn't expect to see at the cinema. And finally, the subject matter indelibly marked me. Ben Kingsley's beautiful performance captured this small, frail man who wielded a power that was not violence, that, but could, that could overcome violence. To a child brought up on Star Wars and Tom and Jerry, this was revolutionary. I felt changed, but I had no idea what to do with that information. I was still scared of the boys at school. Um, I didn't know that Gandhi's teaching and methods could be learned and applied to my own life. So I sought sanctuary in drama at school. This was a relatively safe place where I, where I felt I could be seen without being at risk. Um, and I soon realized that people seemed to like what I was doing. I could make people laugh and I could move them and it was addictive. So being from an immigrant family, <laughs> I had no conception that I could do this as a living. My dad wanted me to go into computing, and, and so did I, really. I was very risk-averse as a child. But finally, at sixth form, my, um, my bravery met my rebellious spirit, and, and, and I decided to go to drama school. And from there, an acting career developed. And I've had some very lean times over the years. But I've also been lucky enough to work at the very highest levels with some of the most talented people in the world. Um, being uh, a South Asian heritage actor in the late 80s, early 90s was, was a mixed blessing. Some things I was barred from. I wasn't going to be doing any um, period dramas, not like nowadays. Um, but other things were, meant that I could play them, South Indian roles, South Asian roles. And my wife, who's a scriptwriter, and I have managed to pay the bills and bring up two children, so it's, it's gone okay. But I, I was also missing something. Acting couldn't quite meet all my needs. My parents are Christian, and my dad loved to sing in the choir. So I was often at church as a kid, and I loved the idea of Jesus and, of course, his nonviolent testimony. But I couldn't make sense of the fact that, according to my church, uh, my friends who were non-Christian wouldn't go to heaven. And I just didn't buy that. So I left the church at 18. And then I had a few years at drama school of hedonism and acting as religion, which I, I wouldn't recommend. Uh, it really doesn't make for a happy life. Um, but I'd always been drawn to environmentalism. I don't know why, because I grew up in the most suburban of settings. We had a tiny garden. But I, I was drawn, I joined Greenpeace when I was young. And, and so I, I was a subscriber to Satish Kumar's um, Resurgence magazine. And in it, I found one month a, a review of a book called Your Life is Your Message by a meditation teacher called Eknath Ishran, who was originally from Kerala. Um, and it was about Gandhi's life and his message. And I was hooked. I was early 20s, and I just I started to meditate, and I started my journey to learn more about Gandhi and his philosophy. Ishwan had also written what became to me the most important book about Gandhi. It's a book called Gandhi the Man. And it's an examination of how Gandhi transformed himself from a timid child and an average lawyer into the man who overcame an empire without firing a shot. And it concentrates on his spiritual journey, not on his political journey. Because Western culture loves to keep Gandhi in the box of the politician. Western culture loves to think of him as a brilliant strategist, etc., etc. It absolutely does not like to consider the spiritual source from which his strength came. But to me, all the great leaders of the last century are people who were essentially powered by spirit. Desmond Tutu, Martin Luther King, the Dalai Lama. There's a lot of clever people out there, but not people I would want to emulate, apart from people like that. I met one of Ishwan's students. He was a professor called Michael Nagler, who Asha knows. 
he taught a course on Gandhian nonviolence at Berkeley University, and he now runs the Meta Center for Nonviolence. So I took his lecture course while I had small children, and I'd be in the kitchen listening to all his lectures while I cooked food. Um, and it was about Gandhian philosophy, and that's when I became immersed in really the details of his philosophy, particularly the two branches of his philosophy, um, which are uh, constructive program and obstructive program, and that was really a revelation to me. At the same time, and coincidentally maybe, I was also asked to voice some of Ishwan's books, because Ishwan had left very strict instructions on his passing that his books should only be voiced for audio by someone who was a long-term meditator. So they asked me to voice them. So I voiced the book, Gandhi the Man, you can hear it on Audible, and his meditation book. And I also voiced his biography of one of his great, um, one of Gandhi's great uh, followers, who was Abdul Ghaffar Khan, Badshah Khan, who led the Pathans and set up the first ever non-violent army, the Kudai Kidmatgars. But I also, at the same time, started voicing Ishwan's translations and guides to the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, the Dhammapada of the Buddha. So I began to understand the Vedanta as well. I began to understand the underpinning of Gandhi's philosophy. And I'm a believer that, as actors, we are lucky that if you voice a book, even though you didn't write the book, something of it goes in on a different level to just reading it because you're trying to be a channel for the author's words. But I wanted to practice nonviolence, um, so I took a course on nonviolent communication, NVC. I don't know if any of you have, uh, know of it from Marshall Rosenberg. It's a wonderful discipline. And for the first time, I started to feel that I might be able to fight that fear that I'd always had of violence, random violence, uh, violence in the street, violence at school. I'd always been frightened of it because I instinctively knew that I wasn't the sort of person who would be strong enough to physically overcome most of the violence that I could see in the world. But I started to suddenly think maybe here was a way that I could start to lose that fear through the power of nonviolence. My wife and I started to attend a Quaker meeting as well. Uh, where I was eventually asked to sit on a committee that allocated resources to grassroots peace building initiatives in East Africa. And I learned a lot from the Quakers, the way they organized themselves, their absolute commitment to nonviolence. And I learned a huge amount from working and supporting grassroots efforts in East Africa for peace, people doing with very little extraordinary work in their communities. Um, and I was finally, I was asked to join the, be a board member through my MVC of a small peace building charity called Open Edge Transforming Conflict, of, of which I'm, at the moment, I'm the chair of that. Um, but I never thought I'd play Gandhi. I was then too young, and I'm still too tall. Um, but time passes, and when the director of The Father and the Assassin, Indu Rubasingham, asked me to play him, at the National Theatre last year, I realized that maybe I had spent decades preparing for this role that I hadn't been aware of. And isn't that the way life presents itself to us often? Um, still, I warned the director that if she cast me, I would be a constant thorn in her side because Gandhi is bigger than us. He's bigger than a play. So if we were going to put him on stage, we had to be sure that every single word he spoke was in keeping with his philosophy. So I was lucky that Anu Palmer was a very generous playwright and she was open to collaboration. And during rehearsals, I was constantly approaching the desk. They used to dread me approaching the desk with my copy of Gandhi the Man in my hand and asking them about a certain speech. I was constantly um, trying to suggest a change or a cut or a more spiritual version of the same words. Um, Indu was much more interested in the political story. Um, she's a very brilliant director, but quite a secular um, uh, person. And I was constantly uh, challenging that <laughs> in lively conversations. Um, this is an exchange that summed up our discussions. There, there was a scene where we were preparing for the salt march and um, Indu thought it was too long, so she suggested we cut a few lines. And she said, oh, we can cut that line 
That's not helping us tell the story. This is the line. Our cause is just, our means are strong, and God is with us. And I counted that they were the most important lines in the whole play. <laughs> and that she could cut anything else but that. And she said, well, I will cut other things. And I said, well, you have to keep those lines. We kept the lines. Um, but the, and the rest of the cast grew accustomed to the long pauses while we battered and back and forth these suggestions to each other. Um, I think we managed to meet somewhere in the middle. So how did I prepare before rehearsals began? You know, playing Gandhi is, um, he's an icon, so what, what are you, how are you gonna approach that? I knew an impersonation was not going to be good enough. I didn't look enough like him to start with. And it wasn't gonna be satisfying for the audience. I needed to portray something of the essence of Gandhi as a human being. Because what is a saint? Uh, the West is uncomfortable with them. They either want to pull them down or keep them on the, on the shelf as a myth. But then on the other hand, there's the devotee who's too dedicated to the holiness of the saint and can't see any flaws or humanity in them. And I knew that if someone was portrayed as perfect, then how can we hope to empathize with them or more importantly, emulate them in any way? Um, so, a favorite, I think, technique of cancel culture is to smear a figure from history so that we no longer have to consider their views or their teachings. And I, I wanted to show someone who was real so that you could avoid that trap. Um, if, we ha if we discard everyone from history that said or did something we don't like, we have to discard, discard most of the knowledge of history. For instance, Einstein was a man who was in an abusive re relationship with his first wife. But are we going to discard the theory of relativity? I don't think so. Um, and in fact, he became a huge fan of Gandhi's in his old age. So again, what point in someone's life are you going to judge them? Gandhi wrote down pretty much every thought in his head for 60 years. And he, he's famously said, I am judged by what I say and believe today. What happened in the past is irrelevant to me. It's how the truth is e e exhibiting itself to me today. So you can take things he wrote maybe in the 1910s or 20s, and it's not necessarily the man he was when he died. But one of the interesting things I discovered about Gandhi is that you can mention him to literally anyone, and they know who he is. I've never come across that with a figure from history before. So I'd be in the greengrocers or the train station or wherever I was and someone would say to me, because they'd recognize me and say, well, what are you doing at the moment? And I'd say, I'm doing a play and mostly people aren't interested in plays. But I'd say, I'm playing Gandhi. And everyone, every single person I ever said that to went, oh, because everyone has an image in their head of the small man in the loincloth who spoke about peace. They might know nothing else about him but he is that iconic. Now, is it because his image is so memorable and easy to copy? It could be. It helped me, certainly, on stage. Um, or is it because there's something deep in his message and there's something revolutionary in the nature of his life and achievements that speaks to people on a gut level? Maybe a bit of both. So I had to try and find the human being behind that uh, initial reaction where everyone goes, I know Gandhi. I started by avoiding any portrayals of him. I didn't watch Ben Kingsley again. All commentaries on him because I needed to return to the source. So I read My Experiments with Truth. I read and reread Hind Swaraj. I couldn't believe how prescient Hind Swaraj is. It, it sounds like a man who's a hundred years ahead of his time, literally. But his source document is the ancient Bhagavad Gita. Um, the philosopher Charles Eisenstein talks about the fact that we are occupying a space between stories as a culture. I think Gandhi really speaks to this. Gandhi was addressing this gap that we find ourselves in, but he was ahead of everyone else, that he saw this. So the still dominant story of the West that has spread throughout the ruling classes of the whole world, but has become hollowed out and is teetering, is the story of separation. It's the Western story. 
It's the story of empires. It's the story of our attempt to dominate nature and each other through history. In this materialist worldview, you and I are forever separate. What is good for you may not be good for me, and vice versa. In this worldview, it is inevitable that I should try to maximize my good at your expense, and it's logical. It's a world where the only kind of force is physical, and the more of it you have, the more powerful you are. Eisenstein then identifies a new and ancient story that is springing up all over the world as we speak. Thich Nhat Hanh calls it the story of interbeing. This is Gandhi's worldview. You and I and all beings are essentially one. We're different expressions of the same underlying consciousness. What harms you must eventually harm me. And what is good for you must eventually be good for me. This is the basis of nonviolence, or ahimsa. In this worldview, there are other powers in the universe than plain physical force. This is Gandhi's worldview, this is ahimsa. And he brought that back into the modern world and into the political world. Nonviolence. In English, it sounds like a negative of something. Nonviolence. But in Sanskrit, the word is wholly positive. It's much more like the English words flawless or priceless. The Upanishads say that Ahimsa is the highest dharma of the universe. So Gandhi knew this, and he set about applying it to the modern world. It's a worldview where, as B. Arnanda said, you can lose every battle, but still win the war. This is crucial about Gandhi. For Gandhi, there was no distinction between the moral choice and the most effective or practical choice. He never had to make a choice between those two things, which is the antithesis of modern politics. So here was his philosophy, but who did that make him physically? How did that make him an embodied individual? That's what I had to find because I was going to embody him. I found a wonderful documentary that some of you may have watched. It's called Mahatma. And it was produced by the Gandhi National Memorial Fund in cooperation with the Films Division of the Government of India. It was made in 1968. I can't imagine it being made now. It's five hours long, but it's absolutely absorbing. It contains virtually all the footage we have of Gandhi. So, of course, most of the footage is silent. But what you see, and sometimes hear, is someone who is always laughing, always reaching out physically to friends and opponents alike. And someone who seems to be able to make those around him laugh, if you watch carefully, whether it was Nehru or Jinnah or the Viceroy. I discovered a direct quote of his that, 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 that I love. If I did not have a sense of humor, I would have killed myself long ago. This image of the laughing sage very strongly brought to mind images of the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And I thought maybe here's a way in for me because I can study them very closely in a way that I couldn't study Gandhi. I found a wonderful documentary about them called Joy. If you haven't seen it, you must really watch it. It's so beautiful. The South African government wouldn't grant the Dalai Lama a, visit, uh, a visa to visit Desmond Tutu. And so Desmond Tutu went to spend some time with the Dalai Lama in India, and it was the last time they were together in their physical bodies. The documentary shows two people who literally never stop laughing, always laughing, but who in the next breath can be talking about deep spiritual truths, completely unashamedly, in a way that in the West we have to apologize for talking about faith and spirit, and they will just launch into it and to how it applies to the modern world. And they seem to be so much fun. They seem to be having so much fun. The difficulties those two men faced, the terrible tragedies, they seem to be much more fun than the Western materialists that I hear on and on on the radio or the TV. Who would you rather be stuck on a desert island with, Desmond Tutu or Richard Dawkins? I know what my choice would be. There's a beautiful moment when the Dalai Lama is asked what Tutu means to him. And he quietly says, when I'm on my deathbed, I will think of Tutu. 
And Tutu's so moved, you can see the tears, and he just holds, they just hold hands. And then a minute later, they're laughing again. So their voices and their physicality, and especially their laughter, was something that I wanted to bring to an embodiment of Gandhi. So on stage, we have less than if we were making a film. We're not in a village in India. We can't feel the heat or see the sky. But what we do have is costume. And when you move from the rehearsal room to the dress rehearsal on stage, that is the thing that can sometimes be a really visceral key to unlocking what it feels like. You know, we talk about standing in someone's shoes. Well, then you get to do that. Or in Gandhi's case, it's chapels. When you move... Um, so we were lucky enough that our designer, Raja Shakiri, is a brilliant, brilliant designer. And she insisted we use Kadi for all our costumes. As you all know, Kadi is the traditional hand-spun cloth that Gandhi championed. So she teamed up with Kadi London, who supplied us with all the Kadi we needed. So suddenly I was on stage looking around at people wearing Kadi, and I was wearing a short dhoti and a shawl, all made from beautiful Kadi. It feels so wonderful. It looks so wonderful. And the effect was dramatic. And I suddenly realized that Gandhi gained a great deal of power from wearing very little. He was always doing the thing that, you, that was, seemed counterintuitive to our Western minds. He didn't need crowns or great gowns. His power was increased by wearing very little. When he visited Buckingham Palace when he was here in the 30s, Churchill was enraged that he went to the, to the palace in his dhoti. And when he was asked about it, he said, um, the king was wearing enough clothes for both of us. <laughs> you see this, this humor that is totally without malice, so beautiful. And it was the same Gandhi who stood in front of a crowd of Pathans in the border region when he went there with Bhad Khan. And he was stood in front of them in his shawl, and they all had their rifles slung over their backs. And he asked them, what are you afraid of? You have to carry guns. I fear nothing. And they threw their guns on the ground. That was the beginning of the Pathans' great you know, movement against the British in the Northwest. So, but even on stage, wearing so little did seem to be a challenge to me. Um, it, it felt vulnerable, and it had an effect on the actors around me. And then when I saw the effect it had, then I realized the power of it. The genius of Gandhi was that he would enact his principles physically, always. So by deciding to only wear two items of clothing, to insist that everyone spend time making their own cloth, to be vegetarian, Whatever the action, it spoke greater volumes than any preaching could. And then when it was coupled with his words and his philosophy, he could move mountains. Anupama's grandmother, as a little girl, she saw, she's fortunately still with us, and as a little girl, she saw Gandhi speak in a park. She remembers it. And to this day, she only owns four saris. That's the profound effect he had on this tiny little girl. And of course, because he was embodying it himself. So this brings us to spinning. It was a surprise to me when they told me that a Cardi expert was coming uh, to teach me spinning. A, I didn't know I was spinning in the play because it's a stage direction, it's not in the, in the scene. And B, I didn't even know that our charka uh, prop worked. I thought it was a, a, just a, you know, I thought it was an antique. So, Asha Bush arrived at stage door one day to teach me how to spin. And I was a little skeptical in that I just thought, this is going to a lot of effort, I could probably fake it. But as soon as I met her, the effect of someone who has been embodying their ideals for decades hits you. And um, I'm feeling emotional even as I'm speaking about it. There was something in the room that I thought, Ah, this, is a, this is a whisper of what the effect Gandhi must have had on people when he met them. Um, and she quietly and calmly taught me how to spin. 
And for those of you who, who do spin, you know that it takes less than a half hour to learn how to spin, but probably years to, to master. She showed me how simple the machine was to maintain and how even a child could do it. And yet the technology was beautiful, elegant, and clever. Gandhi took this ancient, village-grown technology that anyone could do, and he realized that with it, he could challenge the terrible injustice of the British Empire, where Indians produced the cotton, but then they had to sell it to British traders in order to pay their taxes, and then they had to buy it back once it had been processed in British mills. So his obstructive program was that he was going to make the British Empire less and less profitable, because that's, that's what empires are for, extracting profits. His constructive program was to have everyone from the prime minister to the sweeper spinning their own cloth. It's so clever, because it encompasses localization, decentralization, and common people owning the means of their production of the essentials, and thus freeing them from unjust power structures. More than this, it reconnected people to the soil, to a sense of place. And for centuries, Western culture has been moving us in the opposite direction. It's been devaluing the soil, the land, and people who work with their hands. So today, in this city, the most highly valued members of our society are those who work with a pen or a laptop. The class that found lockdown so pleasant because they could sit in their nice gardens tapping away on their laptops and getting their food and other necessities delivered to them by the working classes for whom lockdown was a luxury they couldn't afford. And the person who actually grows the food or carves the wood or spins the cloth has been looked down on and has become an addendum to a polite society. And yet Gandhi argued that if you are dependent on someone else for your food, clothing, or shelter, then you are the lower class person. Now, I'm not a very handy person. I've grown food for myself, and I like to have my hands in the soil, but I've never really made anything myself. But I soon realized the power of spinning. I knew it intellectually, because I'd done my online course on constructive program. But to sit with a handful of cotton fibers and watch them become thread in front of your eyes with just the help of a simple charka was a lesson that you cannot learn on a t laptop. It's the same as planting a tiny tomato seed in the spring and then having handfuls of tomatoes in the autumn. And interestingly, today I was in the garden, and when I was getting ready to come, I thought, oh, I should clean my nails because they're full of mud. And then I realized I was doing exactly the thing. I was thinking it wasn't polite to have the soil under my hands. I mean, I did do it. I made an effort. <laughs> but that's interesting, isn't it? That that's so ingrained in us, that the soil is something that's bad. Um, so I realized quickly that it was um, very tricky and it was addictive. Um, and I realized I had to be fairly decent at it if I was going to do it on stage every night and look like Gandhi spinning, <laughs> who had spent a long time spinning. So I started to practice every day. I thought, I'm going to practice every day in rehearsals when they don't need me. And it became a running joke in rehearsals that everyone would be working and Gandhi would be in the corner spinning. And sometimes I'm afraid to say Asha swearing because he couldn't, he couldn't get it right. Um, but it is meditative. <laughs> And, and they would watch me and they go, look at him, just smiling over there with his charka. Because the other thing is, it's a spiritual practice. It's a meditation. It's stilling the mind. It's a one-pointed attention. And interestingly, all of them, young and old in the cast, one by one, would come up to me and go, what is it that you're actually doing? And I'd show them the thread arriving out of nowhere. And people were just astonished. This is how far removed we've become from reality. That, that people, myself included, had no idea how a thread was made. And they were going, oh my God, that's the thread. That's, now, that's thread. And now I'm winding it onto the spool. And they're going, yeah, oh my God, I see that. It's like magic. Loads of people said to me, it's like magic. This is how impoverished we've become. 
We've become so dislocated from the land and from a place of belonging. And it marks the insanity of our culture. We grow apples in Kent, and we ship them to China to be polished, and then we ship them back again. Did you know that's true? That happens. That's a real thing that's happening right now. It doesn't make sense, but of course, from another viewpoint, it makes complete sense. Because if, it, if we didn't do it, we couldn't make money for the people who sell us these things. So the system is set up. The big business people, like the empire before them, they de-skill us so that they can sell us the things that we used to be able to make ourselves. Now, even our childcare and our entertainment, how many other things can you think of that in the last 50 years have been taken from us and are now sold back to us to give us more time to work for money to pay back the debts that we've accrued in order to keep this system growing, this system that is uh, built on air. Spinning cloth was Gandhi's symbolic and actual, real rejection of this system. So I was spinning, I was wearing khadi, I was visualizing the laughter and body language of Tutu and the Dalai Lama. We'd settled on the right words. It was in very important, for instance, to, to have a good definition of ahimsa. Ahimsa, uh, it can't just be translated as not being physically violent, it's not enough. Peace is not just a state of permanent ceasefire, as we all know. We settled on the term, a complete lack of ill will. Because if you bear no other person or creature ill will, if their, their welfare is genuinely important to you, then everything else follows. Finally, I would ask Gandhi to join me every evening. I believe in the concept, the Greek concept of the muses. We as artists are not making these things in our heads, as Western materialism would have you believe. We're not just conjuring ideas and past experiences like clever AIs. I believe that all art is a channeling of creative powers that lie outside ourselves. The singer, the sculptor, the spinner, the actor, the writer. On stage, I, at my best, when I'm doing my best work, am a channel for Anupama, the writer. Who is a channel for Gandhi? Who was a channel for Sri Krishna? To the extent that we can lose ourselves, we can then let in those creative powers that can then flow through us. And you know, when you've seen the best singers, the best actors, the best paintings, you see people lost. They've lost themselves so that they can channel something bigger than them. So every night in the wings, I would invite Bapu to walk with me and keep me grounded and help me to forget that it wasn't about, to remember that it wasn't about me. Sometimes there would be a light behind me in one of the wings as I was about to come on for the final climactic scene. And I would see my own shadow, my bald head, and I would be holding my staff. And I would feel him there. I could see him. It was, it was strange. I try to do this with any character I play, fictional or real. You try to meet that person. You try to go on a journey to, and respect them. But in this case, it was a blessing and a privilege to walk some distance with him. And from the audience feedback, I can report that some of them felt that presence too. People would say that to me. They felt his presence. That's not because of me. That's because something was happening in the space between us. And the play certainly brought Gandhi to the attention of a lot of people, particularly young people who really knew nothing of him. So many young British Asian people would come and then they would come back with their aunties and uncles and fathers and mothers. Um, and I know from my own 14-year-old experience, a 14 year old self who, who saw the Richard Attenborough film, that once he's in your head, then all sorts of wonderful things can happen. So, what can we learn from Gandhi and apply to today? What have I learnt from this process? Gandhi envisaged an India organised around village democracy, not 
a system where the great and the good decide what's best for the little people. A trait of both capitalism and socialism. Gandhi trusted the people because his worldview was one where people were innately good. Is this unrealistic? I'm afraid to say Nehru, Patel, Jinnah, great, great leaders, they took India and Pakistan in a different direction to Gandhi's vision. And mischievously, particularly as I started to play the play, I did start to think, had he lived, I think he'd have ended up back in prison, probably. He'd have caused so much mischief. And interestingly, his great lieutenant, Bad Shah Khan, did. He spent more time in prison under the Pakistan government than he did under the British government. To be fair, he did live till 98, and he caused beautiful mischief right into the 80s. It was wonderful. Gandhi was his inspiration. So Gandhi's idea of village democracy, it may seem unrealistic, but Barcelona in the 30s made a go of it. And today the Kurds, I don't know if you know about this, but the Kurds have taken advantage of the chaos of the Syrian civil war, and they formed a small state called Rojava. You can look it up, it's an extraordinary place. It's constantly under threat 